Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Game for Thought. As always, I am Allie Weiss. I am joining you from here at Hoest Digital Arts and Entertainment, more commonly known as DIE, and I am our ethics coordinator in international game development, and I'm thrilled and I mean it when I say I am so thrilled to be here for the launch of season four of Game for Thought, our inaugural live stream series here at DIE. Whether you are joining us from Belgium, whether you are joining us from abroad, I think people are joining from all over tonight, which is awesome. Welcome. I hope you feel at home this evening or morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And you, of course, are always welcome here on our Twitch every third Wednesday of the month for yet another Game for Thought live stream. So if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. I'll give a brief overview of what the Game for Thought stream is really all about. So around Three years ago, so almost three years ago to the day, we premiered this stream series with really the intention of bringing ethics in digital entertainment to the table, bringing it to um, the forefront of our attention in a way that maybe wasn't possible within the technical curriculum, within more technical courses. We wanted to find a way to bring give space to discuss topics that inevitably influence things that we do in this world and also the industry that many of you out there will soon join or maybe already are a part of. So every month we come on here and we talk about a different theme, a different topic, always open to suggestions by the way. Uh, And this month we are returning to our roots and we are covering actually the first topic that we ever tackled on Game for Thought, which is violence in games, namely the title for this month, is how much violence is too much violence. A lot to talk about. Uh, We have 75 minutes. We're going to try to cover as many of the pre-submitted questions that are possible. And of course, also we'll follow up with an audience Q&A where you are more than welcome to ask your own questions in the chat as well. Make sure if you have a question for our amazing panelists this evening, you put a Q beforehand so we know it's a question and we can add it to our list of things to ask our panelists. Speaking of panelists, I would love to introduce them. I am thrilled to have four amazing human beings with us joining the stream and giving their insights and experiences regarding violence in games and digital entertainment. We have Firstly, John McGinnis. John is the founder of McGinnis Studios, which is based in the U.S. He was also the screenwriter for Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. So super excited to have John on board with us. We also have Jessica Murray. Jessica is the CEO and co-founder of Wicked Saints Studios, which is also based in the United States. We have Suzanne Freyadis and Susan. Suzanne is the Director of Global Development for the International Game Developers Association, more commonly known as the IGDA. Lastly, but not least, we have Pablo Mata Gomez, and Pablo is a third-year student here at Digital Arts and Entertainment studying independent game production. So a huge welcome to John, Jessica, Suzanne, and Pablo for joining us tonight. Um, As I mentioned earlier, we're going to jump right into the panel discussion where we tackle some questions that you out there in the audience have already asked uh, through our inquiries online over the past couple of weeks. Um, You were interested and you already submitted questions, so we are here and we're ready to answer them uh, as soon as possible. So we'll answer some of those, then we'll open up some space at the end of the stream for audience Q&A as always. Uh, Again, welcome to Game for Thought. I'm so thrilled to be here again. It feels like since the last episode of Game for Thought, many months went by, but also 
like no months went by at all. Um, and it feels amazing. We're also in a new stream studio. So maybe some things look a bit different for to you. That's because we moved uh, houses for the stream studio quite recently. Um, and we're very lucky to have this new studio as well that we're joining you uh, for the stream for. Hang tight. We're going to be with you with the panel discussion in just a second. Um, so stick around and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. I am so thrilled to bring you this panel discussion focused once again on how much violence is too much violence. So I would love to bring to the discussion Jessica, John, Pablo, and Suzanne. Welcome, everyone. It's so great to have you with us this evening. Hello, hello. hello. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Thumbs up for I'm doing great. Awesome. Awesome. It's so nice to see you. Um, yeah, let's just jump into the discussion. Let's just jump into the questions straight away um, from what our audience has submitted. Um, so the first question I see here in the beautiful list of questions, um, and I could also, if I could also ask our panel members, if you are not speaking, if you could mute your, your microphone as well. Um, so we just avoid any non-pleasant um, echoes or what have you. It's okay. It's never a stream unless we have technical problems. <laughs> uh, but our first question reads, can you run us through an abridged history of violence in video games? Um, so brief history of violence in video games. I know there's 
a lot there. There's a lot of meat in that question. Um, when did this topic find prevalence in society, both inside and outside of the game space? So whoever would like to tackle that first question, go right ahead. John, go right it. ahead. I, I, I was uh, just going to jump on to say that um, I'm probably the least qualified person to say this, I think, because... Um, uh, uh, although I uh, worked on Call of Duty, um, I came to the Call of Duty as a screenwriter, an Hollywood screenwriter, and then I was hired as a non-gaming writer, and then I kind of got sucked into this world. So um, I wasn't sort of native to any of this, and so the history of video games, um, I wouldn't really be able to give you an overview on that, but maybe, maybe uh, I don't know, I don't know, um, one of the other panelists would be. Uh, it's a bit of a long, a bit of a bit of an umbrella, to, you know. <laughs> it a is a sunlight. very broad question. Yeah. <laughs> it is a very broad question. What do you but mean by anyone... violence? And what is, you know. Exactly, exactly. John, you read, yeah, you read my mind. Yeah, you read my mind. That's a question we're going to get to uh, very shortly, actually. Uh, but does anyone have any, any uh, insights regarding violence? How long have we been talking about this? How long has this been a topic of discussion in the games world? It's been a topic of discussion since like the 90s. There were, um, it started with Mortal Kombat and the ripping of the spine out of the character after they'd been defeated and the levels of um, gore that were thought to exist in that particular game. And um, what's really interesting is that Mortal Kombat has gotten in many ways more realistic gore as it's um, aged, right? Um, but nobody's talking about it anymore because there's so much it's become so normalized that um, in uh, violence and games, you know, the ripping out of someone's spine is like, well, that's just what you do, right? But when Mortal Kombat first came out, it was shocking to some people because, you know, we've been playing um, games that didn't have that level of gore and um like centipede wasn't there were no guts spewing when you killed the centipede right it was um pac-man the ghost didn't explode like um so it was it had to do with like upping the level of technicality and skill in games to where we got to a Mortal Kombat. Mm -hmm. So Suzanne, uh, based on what you say, the um, you feel like since Mortal Kombat was released, um, in a way, people are desensitized uh, to the level of gore or violence um, that first shocked people when Mortal Kombat was was released. I think it's just more become more normalized, like normalized throughout media. Um, you know, Saving Private Ryan was shocking when it came out in the same way that, um, you know, every time in, in film, every time we sort of up to the violence and gore, like Nosferatu, which was made in like, the 20s or whatever was it was very creepy right but there wasn't like a level of gore and then as film became more adept at um special effects the gore got more realistic and i think we're just seeing that similar um trajectory with games yeah sure john go right ahead yeah i think it's very interesting because I mean, I worked on Call of Duty, and, and just before I was hired, I worked on Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, which came out in 2014. Uh, but the game in the Call of Duty series that everybody was talking about as I was working on it, uh, I think it was Modern Warfare 2, 
where there's an infamous or famous scene uh, where you go into this airport, this Russian airport, and sort of basically mow down um, civilians, just citizens, just like this sort of massacre. And it was it was very controversial at the time, and it got a lot of um, uh, you know media conversation about exactly this issue of of violence in video games and the representation of that. And in some ways, you know, each of these games uh, is there's a higher level of graphic fidelity, but also in that context was about uh, the representation of violence against innocence, I guess, was the was the, the center of that debate. Um, so I don't know. I think it's always been an evolving, ongoing question. And um it's it's you know we can talk about it being in increased levels and like you know the ripping out of out out of the character's spine in the eighties now seems kind of just sort of naive or innocent or I don't know bizarrely innocent you know um, so I don't know I think it's definitely part of the 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 genesis and the evolution of video games for sure and that has a conversation that reflects a conversation in wider society of of all content so. Yeah, I'm totally. Sure um, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pablo, think, go right ahead. Go right ahead. I think another very strong moment on uh, on the media was uh, during the Trump government in 2018, something like that, when he tried to blame video games um, and so on uh, for the school shooting that were happening in that in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's um, a lot of these conversations that we have within the games industry are kind of we see also echoed in other domains. So for example, um, political domains as well. And I think a lot of the conversation, um, yeah, it, we see it as cyclical um, and it comes up in certain moments, whether it's spurred on by a particular politician or, um, or any other figures as such. But actually before we go even further, John, you pointed to, a very insightful question and actually one that I think will really give some um, some weight into this conversation of what we actually mean by the word violence. Uh, when we are asking the question, how much violence is too much violence? What do we mean by the term violence, uh, particularly within the scope of uh, video games? I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, so, my background so the so I'm the CEO co-founder of Wicked Saint Studios, but my former life was a, as an international peace builder, and so I literally huh, got into pe peace building work. Before that, I was telling stories about campaigns of violence, so anti-child abuse, anti-domestic abuse, anti-sexual abuse, and I was telling a lot of stories of bad things after they happen. I thought there had to be a way to stop bad things before they happen. That's how I got into international peace building. Um, so I work for Search for Common Ground. It's the world's largest dedicated peace building organization. Everything from reconciliation after genocide, prevention of mass atrocity work, security sector reform, um, violent extremism. And so violence. So it's interesting because <laughs> the game that we're building for Wicked Saints, World Reborn, is designed, one, to empower young people to handle whatever the world of life throws at them, but two, to prevent and stop violence. Um, and the way that we talk about violence is we look at it as emotional, physical, structural, um, and then societal violence. We can also, of course, add sexual violence into that. And so that is that. Um, that is doing harm at levels psychologically um, uh, to others as well as physically. And then structural, of course, is like things that are, are built into society to oppress and to, and to harm others. Um, and so the, um, so I feel like I'm not necessarily an expert on the, the, the history or what, or what this, you know, how much is too much, but definitely like, how do we stop violence? And that's the whole reason why we made our game. Mm -hmm. And that's also why Jessica, that I'm so happy that you're on this stream as well, because I think with a lot of these kinds of panel discussions and conversations, it can be very like problem focused. Um, and I also don't want to keep it problem focused. I like to look towards solutions as well, um, or really not even solutions, but the way forward. Um, and I think the work that you're doing at Wicked Saints is really, yeah, it's 
amazing. It's it's super unique as well. So thanks so much for for that. So according to you, the description of violence, it's it's really ma- multifaceted um, in a way. Anyone else would yes. like to? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jessica. Go ahead. No, I totally. Um, but yeah, I, I want to give other people a chance. But yeah, I mean, often we think of violence as just the physical violence, um, but all of us as human beings know that some of the scars that have lasted the longest on us um, are not physical, and so um, we see it. And so the way that like we take our approach is like we call it. We have like a common ground activism approach, which is attack the problem, not the person. And we see conflict as an indicator that there's a problem, um, but not necessarily a bad thing. So conflict is just a part of being human. And so if you choose to handle conflict violently or destructively, okay, that's bad. But conflict can also be an opportunity to improve something because it's an indicator that there's something, that there's a problem for someone. Um, So it's an opportunity to fix that problem. And so that's kind of the fork in the road where Basically, what we see is that, like, the world has taught us that you have two choices. You either fight or you flight, like, do or die, um, eat or be eaten. Um, But actually, there's a multitude of other choices that happen in any situation um, that could help you um, de-escalate a situation, that could help you take that person instead of making them an enemy, help make them an ally, solve a problem, and prevent harm. And for our, we have a behavior change model that we have for our game and we break it up into sections of like belief attitudes that also include self-efficacy and social norms intention of action and action and it's really interesting because like the first step is actually belief and two I, examples of belief is like i have options on how to respond so even just showing and and, and understanding the belief that there's more options and how to respond than just fight or flight is actually a huge in the progress of intention of, of lowering violent acts. And, and then the second belief is that I'm this kind of person um, that does this, does it a certain way versus doing it another way is like the core kind of foundation that starts our heroes on our, on our hero journey. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, I'm just just a quick side note. I, I'm so thrilled also with this group of panelists that we have this evening. Such diverse experiences and backgrounds. Um, so I think this is really the perfect the perfect group of people to be having this conversation with. Um, any other thoughts about what violence for you means? Um, what the definition looks like, especially when we think about video games. Um, I'm kind of wondering, Johnny, because it's really fascinating listening to the other panelists and bringing their experience to this. Um, you know, my experience, obviously, working on Call of Duty, um, it's a you know, mass popular game. There's a representation or a presentation of violence or a, an invitation to enact or reenact or playfully act violently. Um, you know, but the bigger question is, what is what is the effect of that? I mean, I, you know, I... I you know, we talked about um, you know politicians scapegoating violent video games as the problem. Um, you know, I'm I'm personally you know I'm single dad to an 11 year old boy, so I'm very much acutely aware of you know young men um, playing video games and the culture of that and the effects of that or the potential implications of that. Um, I generally tend to view content as a whole as somewhat just reflective of the wider culture as a whole um, as rather than being the cause then rather the 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 effect of of whatever violence is is in society and it's a reflection of that um you know i don't think uh, putin or hamas or benjamin netiat is 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 was formed by playing call of duty (laughs) it's like they're not they're not uh they're not they're not they're not people are are and there's you know also you know the Audiences, uh, you know, the consumers of violent video games come from all walks of life from, you know, I mean, I'm from the UK, which is very, very minimal gun crime. There's no guns, you know, uh, um, and yet it's Call of Duty is hugely popular. And so, you know, there's no gun crime that comes from can be pointed at like video games. But I'm kind of interested in the wider discussion because I think some of the other panelists, you know, bring 
a lot more worldly experience to this equation and are making games that they want to be have a positive impact so games obviously have an impact by implication in that you want to have a positive impact well is there a uh, you know is there an aspect of modern gaming culture that is um negative i mean that's an, a yes in many ways but what's precisely is that do we think and and how as we as creators as game makers can we you know impart a, a beneficial effect mm -hmm. yeah just hopping off of that um the comment you made uh john about the the scapegoating of, of video games as being uh there being a causal link between the digital representation of violence and, and the real world manifestation of violence. I, I always like to have kind of some kind of like state of the industry or state of research, state of play um, idea before we really dive uh, deep into the discussion. So I'm as somebody, let, let's pretend that I like know nothing about violence in video games. I'm just curious. Um, where is the discussion now in terms of the debating the causal link between digital representation of violence and the physical manifestation of that violence? Um, has it been proven that there is an, an actual link um, in 2023 versus, let's say, like 2010? Um, where is that discussion now? Well, um, I am a DA student, but I'm also graduated in psychology. So a little bit of my knowledge is uh, and research is around the topic of uh, violence in video games. And it was also very interesting uh, hearing Jessica and John also some talk about it um, and seeing that we have studied uh, studies uh, showing that uh, the real violence that uh, affect people and make people behave uh, in a violent way is the family violence, is structural violence, is a bullying behavior. But we have no solid scientific evidence that video games cause uh, violence in the real world. In fact, we have a study saying quite opposite. We have a study saying uh, from 2018 and 2019, we have a study saying that there is no link. And we have one from 2017 that is super interesting, showing that, in, for example, in periods in which a AAA game is uh, released, the violence uh, in the country and the, in the situation, in the place, uh, goes down. Mm, can have many reasons around that, and the, the study is quite uh, quite big. Uh, but I think that's a that's a nice sum up of the situation. All right. So actually, in fact, it can yeah. I mean, it have the opposite of effect uh, based on the study that you mentioned, Pablo. All yes, right. I think I think it's um, you know I'm so glad that we're talking about video games as a scapegoat because it is something that politicians want to tend to point to to be like no. This is the problem over here, these violent video games. Um, when there's a lot of structural problems, there's environments, there's um, choices, there's options, there's a whole bunch of reasons why, <laughs> why uh, people choose violence. Um, and violent video games is probably one of the least. Um, I will say, though, that there, from what I understand, there hasn't been a direct link to like gun violence or like immediate violence. But there has, especially depending on what your home environment is, um it, there has been links to aggression so um just being a little bit more aggressive um towards friends and others depending and so but again i think some of that it's not it's not in a in a vacuum right that also there's there's certain groups of kids depending on their environment and their home that it might actually affect more than others um I can tell you on a violence prevention side, one thing, like the reason why we use games is so powerful is that they're built with core game loops. So every time you go around, they get more, get better and better and better. And that's how you gain mastery and mastery is how you start to believe in yourself. Um, and so, and on a, on a story side, behavior change happens through not giving people information, but through experiences. And so games and stories are a really powerful way to have that experience. And so on a violence prevention side, we, again, it's more about like kind of being able to, like when we can take people through scenarios and put them in scenarios and give them options about how to behave, like we actually start to see, like that's when we actually start to see some transformation and people putting themselves in a scenario, what would happen if, um, 
And then one other side note I'll say from the throwback of my um, work that we did in peace building work is we used a lot of media. Um, and what we found was that media that had really like high fantasy um, where there, there's more of dissonance where people separate. So even like we're trying to do positive change here. And if there was too much separation between the fantasy and reality, and you're talking about like, x-men or orcs but you're really talking about like social economic whatever like people didn't draw that connection themselves um it had to be in a the story setting had to be in a situation where players could realistically actually see themselves for the biggest kind of um connections to experience to be able to tr transfer over so maybe that's also a thing you know like when you're in the like if you're in like a high fantasy land um, I could also see that, like, maybe not making those ties as much yeah. as possible. Then it doesn't necessarily transfer if it's more of a kind of fantasy, um, kind of, yeah, an escape, escapism, uh, mechanism through identifying with another character. Um, yeah. I, no, totally. a lot of questions were asked, um, beforehand about specifically the, the difference and the focus um, on the manifestation, and I even see a uh, something in the chat saying, why even talk about this, um, which is a valid point. Uh, why talk about this if there's no connection? Um, and I, have a, I had a lot of questions beforehand about why there is so much discourse regarding violence in games um, in comparison with like film, TV, other forms of media. Um, and as consumers, I think all of us of all different kinds of mediums. Uh, I just want to get your input regarding the conversation about violence in games versus violence in, in some other uh, platforms. I think that violence in games, well, games are immersive, right? So different it and that's one of the things we love about them is that it's different than other forms of media you get to interact directly with your settings and surroundings and um one of the games that was um like an experimental game that was created by um lindsay grace who's um faculty in florida she did a game that was on the Nanjing Massacre, which was a huge uh, massacre of um, Chinese uh, military. And um, the game was, instead of shooting people, you were trying to heal people. So it's in, in the midst of a massacre, right? So... All of this is happening, and I think one of the reasons we talk about violence in games is because there's so many ways to interpret it, and that there are experiences like that where you're you're seeing the futility of your of healing, right? You're trying to heal, but it's a massacre. You're gonna fail, um, but it's a really cathartic game. It really gets you to understand the um, like the horrors of being in the middle of a military action where you have no um, ability, you have no control, right? And um, because we're you're as a player, you're experiencing it you're getting this cathartic experience that you just don't get from even like film. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Thank for you. you, Suzanne, it comes down to the immersion. It comes down to that agency uh, that we see in games. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Jessica. Yeah. Just to piggyback off of that. I mean, I think in general, we have all become a lot more desensitized to violence. Um, in general because of media and films and game of thrones and now the boys and all of that like we're we're just seeing like some pretty gnarly too many red wines yeah y yes no exactly like we we are seeing it um the reason why i moved over from just 
stories on a screen to games is exactly what um, Suzanne is talking about. It's this, um, it's this immersive experience of behavior change. So this is, so I used to teach strategic storytelling to young activists all over the world from Myanmar, Burundi, Nigeria, Colombia. Um, and storytelling is really powerful because like I said before, behavior change doesn't happen by giving people information, it happens to experiences. Stories are a really powerful way that you can have an experience that you'd never be able to have. Like, I don't know what it's like to be a trans woman, but I can listen to the story of one and experience empathy and other experiences from that. The reason why we've made our game World Reborn an interactive story game, because now you are the main character. You are making decisions and you're experiencing the consequences of your decisions, but in the safe digital fantasy world. And so we bring the experience that much closer um, and it makes games that much more powerful to be able to impact behavior. And so I don't know exactly, but I've heard that games have been used by militaries to help desensitize things. Cause it's, and I think it's because it puts you immersively in this space where you can feel what it's like to pull some kind of trigger and to see something explode in front of you versus a more passive experience on a, on a screen where you're watching these things, even though I would argue that both very much desensitize us to now we're watching horror on Instagram, on you know, of real life things that are happening in the world right now. And like, I feel like I'm able to stomach a lot more than what I was even like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And it just has me asking the question, like, is it because all media in general is just, we just show much more violent things. Absolutely, absolutely. And I also, I, I mean, for you mentioned Game of Thrones, but for example, even after watching something like Game of Thrones, I feel like I can stomach a lot more than, than the alley weas of, of pre Game of Thrones. Um, Suzanne, you mentioned the word cathartic. Um, And that directly actually feeds into um, another question from an audience member regarding the impacts of playing games um, on the player and whether or not playing a, a game that emits violence in some way can actually serve as some kind of relieving mechanism, some kind of cathartic me mechanism that could potentially reduce real world violence um is that is there any truth to that you think is that too far of a stretch um whether the act of playing games and manifesting violence digitally could actually have um some kind of positive impact on the player in the long run people do really experience like a release of stress from playing a very stress like that um, experience of being like Call of Duty, right? You're in a really intense situation and then it, it's over, right? And like, that's a release. And I don't play um, Call of Duty. I play um, like doinky fantasy games, but I love when um, like a bomb explodes right it's like we and um it makes me feel like a sense of um because it's not real right I'm blowing up some mushrooms or whatever but um but it's still violent right that's still a violent action but um I think there's a real sense of cathartic catharsis and people do play games for relaxation. People play Call of Duty for relaxation. Is that concerning? Is that is that something that is, <laughs> and that, that that's a it's a serious question. Is the fact that it that we do we need that release um, as human beings? Is that concerning that that we? use video games as a medium through which to have that cathartic release? I think it's interesting that, um, you know, Call of Duty was obviously the biggest game on the planet for quite some time, still pretty much up there. You know, the other game, Fortnite. Fortnite, first per, uh, third-person shooter, 
Um, it's it's um, you know I I don't have an answer, but I, it's very much you know part of the culture and seems to be something that we as a species, or maybe it's just it's not even just young men, young boys. Um, you know the the popularity of these games transcend a, a lot of different groups, um, and it seems to satisfy some need or desire. Um, I I think there's a catharsis in 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 there for sure. Um, but I I don't know. I just look at some, any anything that establishes itself as a mass medium that has mass popularity around the world does so for a reason, and I think that reason is is very interesting. Um, you know why is it that that Fortnite, a battle royale, is so incredibly popular? Uh, why is Call of Duty so incredibly popular? Um, you know. That's what's interesting to me. Yeah, to take it in like, to piggyback, but in like a slightly different direction, I think, so there's one idea of like actual, like the, the, the violence itself is, but also like the state that you find yourself in when you play video games is this flow state. Um, and like that state itself um, is like very, like wherever you find your flow state, it can be very relaxing. Um, it can also be very addictive. Um, and it's, it's always interesting because there's also, I think, a temptation, like now moving this into like mental health. Um, I do think that there is a temptation to disappear completely, um, from real world, um, with, and this isn't just video games. This is through social media. This is other things that we've seen, like a steady decline in mental health with young people and I believe a big connection to that is actually because like uh, is us actually asking ourselves a question like how much does technology take us further away from authentic human connection and a Harvard study 80 year Harvard study just came out that said like the number one indicator of a healthy long life ment mentally and physically is um, close positive relationships and that they're a better indicator of um, better indicator of a long and healthy life than social status, IQ, or even genes. And um, and so I believe that video games can facilitate even more authentic connections. Um, like within our game, we have you go from a flow state of like playing the game to actually doing like breathing and like reflection in real life to actually like prompting you to engage with Re the real world and real people in ways that we believe is going to build you up. But I think that's also a question, you know, of like, of getting in this, like how much, like some of it of like the escapism itself. And I think a lot of it's really healthy that like we have that, but at what point do we also say like, Hey, but like these, you know, like connecting authentically with other humans is also something that is, is important to our, to our lives. And so there's, yeah, go ahead, Suzanne, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, that authentic connection, and that often comes through the close relationships uh, that people form when they're battling um, something in a game, right? So um, I have two autistic kiddos, and um, one of them, like, their friendships are online and through World of Warcraft, through fighting monsters and killing stuff. And um, and that's where their friendships are formed. And that happens through Call of Duty. You know, you form these strong connections with other people where you're going into battle together. And I think that... Um, that sense of connection is really important. And um, and I do think that there's like a human need for destruction or some form, like if you think about like forms of violence aren't always shooting somebody, they can be um, about the way you treat people and, you know, like middle school girls, their forms of violence are very different than male forms of violence. But it's still like, I think there's violence in our society that maybe 
playing these games helps people like work through if that makes sense so actually it's a bit meta there so actually the engaging in a way um through connecting through violence in video games actually in a way for what you say suzanne could be tackling other forms of violence that are manifested in one's real life. Yeah, that's, I, I don't know, it just sort of came out of nowhere, but... Yeah, but it's super interesting. That's why we have these discussions. <laughs> so thoughts and theories come out of nowhere. Yeah, but it's super interesting. Um, John, you also mentioned that, that you have uh, a little one at home as well. And I see that you wanted to jump into the, the conversation. Yeah, no, so your, go right ahead. Your, what was your question? Um, so my, my next question is, um, there's a lot of conversation also, uh, especially with kids in mind, um, regarding censorship, um, and the limit of violence or these kinds of things that we don't want our kids to have, uh, access to or we don't want them to see just yet um, and so we come back to the word censorship we come back to the word regulation um, and so many out there uh, refer to games as an art uh, an art form um, and with that being said the conversation with regards to censorship changes a bit um, if you view games as an art form um, and I want to have your take on games and censorship, um, whether or not you see game, for example, Call of Duty as, as a form of art, and if so, can censorship even take place, or should it, in your opinion? Um, I don't know, I don't really take it as like what you, you know, it, it's kind of, it's a bizarre world we live in, because uh, I think social media in the last 10 years has really just taken us into a space that, that we've, never experienced before and we're still working out what that actually means you know in my social media feeds you can suddenly be doom scrolling and you're just watching basically snuff videos you know when i was a kid there was like <laughs> idea of snuff videos of like videos that people actually got killed in and yet you know you can just jump into you know instagram or facebook or whatever um platform you're on and be watching almost real-time videos of of combatants in Ukraine being killed um, on screen again and again, or even just like this sort of, you know, car crashes or accidents. Or we, this, this, this stuff is so prevalent and readily available to everybody. Um, I'm not really sure what that effect of it is, or or why there it even exists. I mean, it's certainly there's a sort of morbid fascination with that sort of stuff, um, and obviously. The notion of protecting our kids in some way from this in that they are the generation that is is most available that's most available to because technologically that is that is their world more than myself as, a, as an adult um so you know it and and the, just like these issues you know having an 11 year old boy who's also diagnosed autistic not that i really use that label in 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 uh, him but you know he's a he's a young boy and he's growing and so these issues uh that may have been somewhat theoretical in my life of you know being a creator and you're making stuff suddenly come home when you're having to deal with your son and the repercussions of certain things that happen within a video game and how his relationships and his life are mediated through those video games or facilitated mm -hmm. through those video games because i think that's another important aspect of we're talking about like real relationships and and online relationships i think online relationships has in many ways facilitated a lot of authentic uh relationships but on there's another hand on, on another hand those relationships can be kind of cut short because there is no further quote unquote real uh, space for those relationships to grow and develop um censorship i don't know it's interesting because i've worked a lot in vr and um and my son's my beta test <laughs> or he, he's you know he's on the on the quest or something and he likes certain vr games i remember one of them a few years back was um uh, uh what is it uh 
as a sword and sorcery or it was it was a you know a slash and you know and and there's obviously like gore settings and they're sort of i don't know you know you can literally you know set the levels of gore that you you want to be exposed to um and you know and i was, I was like looking at this stuff in vr and him playing it and i was like you, you as a sort of parent you have a visual visceral reaction to oh is this good is this going to be damaging to him in some way or whatever and uh, and obviously there's all sorts of content that has you know is regulated in terms of what you know who is this recommended for you know classification systems and stuff but um i don't know it's um it's an interesting question you know I'm, i very much have a very uh you know very connected relationship with my son and we talk about all this sort of stuff not just within like you know how video games reflect and manifest behavior but how behavior is manifested and reflected in social media as well um it's an interesting discussion and when you have an 11 year old it's it's very interesting to see all this being played out in reality in real time right in front of you in your life and i think it's i, I don't have any hard and fast sort of answers but i'm very acutely um attuned to the uh to the discussion and the and the debate so mm -hmm. and when you see john uh or yeah when or suzanne uh for the matter if you see these ratings like for example the the age ratings um what kind of weight did those have uh on the the games that that your children play or the what did do those age ratings have weight? Um, do they play regardless of the age rating? Um, Suzanne, I don't know if you wanted to uh, jump in, but uh, I mean, for my son, um, it really depends on what he's into. I mean, I, I the uh, it's interesting. I was actually because I'm working a lot in Unreal these days, um, and I was uh, I was having to read through all the the um user license agreements for you know unreal engine and uefn and all these different stipulations about what they do and there's almost like a sort of corporate um uh, adherence they have to adhere to these and say these statements about this this is this and this is for this person and this is for that person and you know something like uefn it's like you're not allowed to make content specifically aimed at children but all content should be at a um, rating of a 13 year old so you're kind of like it's kind of like this strange paradox in which what is being created and who and how it's being consumed it's this strange world of commerce and culture that sort of is spinning around uh and the one hand being kept very sort of infantile and yet sort of in some way being sensorial um i don't know i i don't, I don't i'm not i'm not sensorial at all i mean it's like people will say things like oh they don't let their kids listen to hip-hop because or swear words in in music and i'm kind of like that's for me is ridiculous because i'm you know my son listens to whatever he wants to listen to with whatever words are used in there because that for me is is the starting point of of a discussion and what are these you know, it's particularly in here the use of the n-word you know but that's we have a whole debate and discussion about what that is and so he's very attuned and it becomes conversant and aware of, of the debates that are going on and how that debate is facilitated by listening to the music um and so same with with the games for me it's it's a means of facilitating the conversation um and i always think well we're raising adults we're not actually raising children so um you know i'm i'm like what do you think of this <laughs> same with scary movie i mean you might be scared out of his mind i was like okay you can't watch that because that's gonna give you nightmares but it's, it's it's no hard and fast rule for me so um i don't know that's only my personal experience though yeah with with the main element being discussion um having those discussions with your son uh because otherwise if if, if there's a hard and fast rule regarding censorship then those discussions don't actually occur i i think the rating system is really important for people who aren't in the games industry and yeah that's a great point suzanne because i've had so many parents just be completely 
perplexed. They don't understand how to read the description on a box. Their kid wants to play whatever. They don't understand what that game is. And even if they do the research, a lot of people I know have just been confused. Like, And then they'll buy the game and then they'll be shocked. Right? They're like, oh my god, I did not know this was so whatever, right? And um, so I think that the rating system, how people adhere to it is up to them, right? They'll get a sense like, okay, this is for under eight. And people are, you know, infants are using iPhones now. So people are needing some kind of guide that they, just like with um, films, right? They need a guide so that, like, when I went to see um, Saving Private Ryan, there was a six-year-old in the audience. Well, that was, who freaked out because... (laughs) That was an intense film. And so um, I think the ratings are there as a guideline so that people can can make decisions and have conversations who aren't familiar with the industry. That is a really great point, Suzanne. It's interesting, actually. I I kind of take the exact opposite view, and and I think that, the rating system in some ways lets people off the hook or parents off the hook and that they think that that's okay so they can just like oh my kid's okay watching that because it's it's so and so rating uh and they're not engaging and i think there's also a, a kind of cultural disconnect uh, that i noticed within myself because the generation that's growing up now which is just purely digitally native and you know watching my son play fortnite and the way he's talking and saying stuff around death that to somebody who's not initiated in that world it sounds a lot more awful than it is to the to the kids playing it to them it's play it's fun and yet they're saying kill me kill me kill me kill me (laughs) and the sort of types of language and and that they use to an audience that isn't used to that to an older generation of parents it feels a lot more shocking than it actually is they just it's not even that it's it's worse morally wrong incorrect it's just different it's just a different form of expression it means something different to that community than it does to the adult community so i think there's this sort of strange sort of disconnect with this generation particularly of a sort of generation of parents that don't understand the culture of their kids and um that i think can be problematic in that the, the rules or the 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 rules that get um handed down for oh you can watch this but not watch this aren't necessarily helpful um because they're not really reflect they're not really an understanding of what's what's going on so so i don't know i mean i i'm interested to hear what you, you say suzanne about your experience with ratings because i think they do have a place just in terms of like signposting there's this type of content do you want your kid or as a sort of general signposting but also i i think um you know it's important as parents to be connected to your kids that's the point so that you're really understanding how they are experiencing this content that's the key you know you can show them anything really as long as they have some framework that you're giving them to kind of understand it so and i'm not sure the ratings yeah. always do that but there is a function that's valuable i there, see so. jessica you want to add add on to that as well go right ahead and then we're going to get into yeah. some, to some audience questions as well. Go right ahead. Awesome. That sounds great. So, yeah, I'm a mom as well. I have two kids. And so I think I think on one side as a parent, like one thing, I'm a lot more worried about like the social media stuff and things like that. I think I do think like once you see something, you can't unsee it. Um, and so that is something that I can say. And so when you have kids, my age, like you want to like keep their innocence. But my kids totally watch all the Avenger movies and Jurassic Park. So I don't know how how that's going for me. Um, But I think the part of discussion is, um, is so important on the ratings. And I think it's our, but I think ultimately, I mean, our, our theory at Wicked Saints is that like our, in order to create like real change, 
that like whatever we create has to be so fun that young people opt in themselves and they cho- and they choose to play our game versus being required to do it. And so I think our challenge is like video game makers is like, okay, like if we want to like I because there's people have this, what I consider a false assumption that like if something is this good, then it can't be that fun. And I, you know, I'm like, no, like you can have just as good like art story, like conflict is what makes things really exciting and like so like you know have all of that in there and that's why like why on our teams like we have artists from spider-verse and love death and robots and our writers are from owl house and from like triple a mobile games and our design and our game designers with like angry birds to walking dead and so i think the challenge is making like high entertainment enough so that like people opt in to play it and have these experiences um, and then my other point on censorship is just like, and what I think games can help us is that parents are censoring a ton of things right now for their kids um, through education. So like now, like even learning about indigenous people history, black people history, like that's all being censored out of our schools. Um, and so like within our game, like we've snuck in like a little thing about freedom writers, like, and it's like part of like this, and it like fits into the story in, in a way that when we tested it before having all the beautiful art and the augmented reality and everything else that we have we just tested a short scene about like where our players basically go back in time like go back in time and like have this experience with like the freedom riders and it's five minutes of gameplay it was only text-based and after playing we had 80 percent of teens said that they felt more confident to engage in a conversation around race and it was all like funny like wow. you you had the choice to clap back you had all these choices and so i feel like where the world is censoring what i would consider the wrong things like that we have these really cool opportunities um within games to like get stories and experience and marginalized voices and like a high entertainment but it has to be high entertainment and high and high value mm-hmm. so censorship is happening but for you jessica we're focusing or a lot of the world is focusing on on the wrong things yeah we're all i mean we're we're just all trying to feed our bias right and stay mm-hmm. in lanes where we're comfortable and like for me bias is a head issue so we often treat bias like it's a heart issue like oh you're a bad person because you're racist or homophobic or whatever but oftentimes bias is a head issue where like we are, our brains are designed to jump to conclusions. Like that's, and to jump to assumptions. Like that's how we survived, you know, the African safari. Like we, like the, the grass is moving. We have to assume that there's a predator there. And so our brain jumps to make these assumptions. But the cool thing is, is that our brain can also be rewired with new information comes in and new experiences comes in. And that's the power that games have is to bring in another point point of view, put in like, oh, like you thought you only had these two options, you actually have five. And like, what happens when you do it? Like we can start to do that rewiring and adjust things like, like bias and, and in places where like, if it's getting cut out of schools and, you know, or it's being seen as this other thing, like we have opportunities to, uh, if it's being censored to other places, we have an opportunity to bring in. And this is what like where diversity comes in, like having all types of different game designers um, sharing different stories and different perspectives. And, but again, it has to be like high entertainment. And so, um, and that's where like funding comes in. Like we, like we're lucky, like we just got back by Riot Games and venture funded and closed on a big seed round. But most I feel like, games that do that kind of stuff. Yeah, we got 3.5. Congratulations. Woo. We're a hype team over um, here too. I appreciate it. I appreciate all all the hype. But it has to be because it's people are like, oh, like kids don't like those kind of games. It's like, well, if you put like, you know, $20 million into this game and $50,000 into this game, of course, they're going to pick that game, you know. And so just like giving young people more options for like high level entertainment, I think we'll also see a lot of good come out of it amazing thank you so much um i'm gonna turn to the audience questions um as always if you have a question you would like to bring to our panelists in these last 10 minutes or so go ahead ask it in the chat just put a q beforehand um so we know it is a question i see a question in the chat has the amount of violence in the game 
does it also have to do have something to do with the player archetypes? For example, the killer, the socializer, the achiever, the explorer, uh, looking into the relationships between the archetypes of players and the amount of violence. Anybody, anybody I'll, I'll interested jump in, in taking I'll, that one? I'll, Go I'll, right ahead. I'll jump. I'll jump Go in. Go right all, ahead. All I can say is, is that like, so designing games, we totally like at the archetype of the player and you're looking at like your player, like your thrill seekers, right? Who are like wanting to battle, compete and mastery and like what kind of archetypes of players that you have in a game. Um, for us, like we like a lot of like expressionists, um and you know like there's expressionists there's strategists there's networkers and there's you know kind of like bridging the gap between them and there's this really great i don't know what it's called right now i'm blanking the name but it's cool because you can like see like what different types of features based on different types of archetypes of a player that you have and that you tend to like build so you, you want to you want to know your player and your community our game is hard because we're like literally creating a new genre of games we're calling it real fantasy so like your real life um your real life actions actually fuel your ability to make the game but so we, we've been using archetypes a lot because we're like okay like we can't just say like multiplayer like you can't just say like this kind of rpg or like whatever like we have to look at those different archetypes and so um, and I was just at a I was just at a retreat with a whole bunch of other game founders, and some of them just have battle games, and they're totally looking at that, and they know what their players are looking for. Feedback is like a huge thing. So our game is mobile, but like we're, like any time you touch the screen, it should feel good. But like it's the same thing of like pulling, you know, like hitting a button and having an explosion. Like that feedback gives you a hit of dopamine, and so game design we're also looking at like and so violence is like an easy way to do that right like we can have like you can like pull the trigger and a head explodes that gives you immediate feedback that what you did was correct and so that you can continue on that loop now maybe you hit two heads back to you know like it's it, that's the kind of things that we look for when we design games all right, moving on to the second question in the chat I see um Apple Y asks is the level of violence that is too much different depending which group of people or things are perpetrating the violence or having it be perpetrated upon them? Um, so I think if I understand this question correctly, um, it is asking about the types of characters in games that are perpetrated perpetrating the violence uh, versus the types of characters that are having violence per perpetrated upon them um is that uh is the are the characters different um if i understand that question incorrectly happily let me know um is the level of violence too much different depending on which groups of people are perpetrating them i am um I think it does matter, for instance, like in GTA, when um, you could like go to a hooker and then beat up the hooker and get your money back. Like to me, that level of sexual violence like really bothers me um, versus like the violence where you're just running over a pedestrian, right? Like, so in my um it for me it it doesn't matter like i only want to shoot the bad guys whoever the bad guys are that what like and whoever i and like and i think it needs to be more of an amorphous like yet again for me a troll or a hedgehog or whatever it is um if if that's who i'm shooting there needs to be a strong argument made for why i'm shooting that troll mm -hmm. so the uh, there needs to be an argument for you <laughs> in the game uh in terms of the perpetration of violence against someone 
Right. Um, and whether it is more acceptable in one case versus another case. Yeah. It's interesting because, of course, you know, zombies have become the ultimate kind of bad guy. And it's the most legitimate bad guy because they're brainless zombies. <laughs> so um, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's interesting with uh, there's a deep, deep misogyny within the culture that gets played out within certain video games, which is troubling, but I'm not quite sure how to kind of deal with that, I guess. <laughs> you know? um, but it's also that's, interesting. That's a topic that, for uh, an upcoming, for another stream, I think, right there. We could yeah, take oh, like a sure. full other 75 yeah. minutes on that too. Yeah. But I think it's interesting that the zombies are like this kind of just porn character, P-A-W-N character, <laughs> that, 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 that is just this vehicle for this projection of violence onto and is somewhat benign in that way. So I, I don't know. Um, I have I have thoughts, but they're not fully fledged. So. No worries at all. Pablo, did you want to add something as well? Well, I I agree on the topic. I I do think uh, there is a difference on sensitivities matters. And uh, that's why, for example, zombies and Nazis has, are been the two big guys uh, that we find in between everywhere. Like, they are the bad ones. They are against humanity. We all can agree on that. Like, dead is bad. And, like, the Nazis were bad. That's an easy thing. But then you find um, fantasies and situations in, in which you can be ethically enormously incorrect um, using violence. And... And at the end, it's a difficult. I think it's a difficult topic because uh, I completely agree that uh, permitting uh, the perpetration of those acts uh, in environments that are already feeling that they have the right to do it and people that they feel they have the right to behave in that way is a bad thing. And at the same time, uh, finding um, that video games and art in general shouldn't have these restrictions and prohibitions uh, around it. As uh, John was saying, I have thoughts around it, but <laughs> not much more than that. Yeah, it's interesting because Renee Gittens just released a new game called Potions, A Curious Tale. And in that game, violent, it's a um, problem solving, a puzzle game, but violence is, um, is an option, but it's rarely the right option. So I think that that kind of thoughtfulness put into the game around giving violence as a choice, but maybe it it doesn't get you what you're hoping, like it doesn't solve the problem, it doesn't um, fit, like solve the puzzle, I think is an interesting um, thought project. Yeah, that's what we have within our game. Like, you'll always have the options, but it will play out. Because a lot of times, violence and fantasy, right? If you're strong enough, you can dominate and be, like, the best and the king or, like, solve the problems. But, like, in real life, if you're in a conflict situation, you hand aggressively, the chance of retaliation is really high. Whether it's immediate or down the road, they're going to look to come after you. And then if you act passively in a situation, then you just encourage dominant behavior. Um, or you become a bystander and you leave victims vulnerable. So like, um, so it's interesting because like, either like passive or aggressive, like we say like doesn't get you out of your deep dark pit. But there's a whole other option, so of options you can have. And so like within our game, like we have it so that it's like psychological, like like no, like you can choose whatever to do, and then most likely what would happen in real life, depending on the choice that you make, will happen to you. So that you can practice dealing with stuff and you can see you can handle things a violent way and sometimes you can handle things violently and win in that moment or lose in that moment but it's going to have consequences in the in the future for you um and so like that's that's like totally what we play but we usually play that out through through story within our game amazing thank you so much we could go on for another 75 minutes i am absolutely sure um and i feel like we only touched the tip of the iceberg here uh but we really encourage you in the chat to keep chatting uh keep discussing this uh thank you for listening to us before uh we 
of course, thank our lovely panelists, Jessica. Um, I know you wanted to share um, about the the early access uh, for World World Reborn, so I want to give over give the spotlight uh, to you. As always, we are we are hype people, also at Digital Arts and Entertainment, so we want to support everyone out there. Uh, but Jess, I, I give the word to you. Thank you so much. Okay, so hopefully there's a QR code coming up somewhere, or there, I'll send you the link to our Discord. And so if you join us now, we'll give you early access to World Reborn or what we're building. And so Um, and the other cool part is that, so it's an interactive story. It has real world quests that are facilitated by augmented reality. And then we're actually going to crowdsource ideas for those real life missions from actual players and young people yourself. So it can be peer to peer and feature you within the game. So you come join our discord, play the game. If you love it, we'll give you opportunities to like actually have your ideas so that like you're featured within our game. So that's my, that's my shameless promo. I hope you join us. I hope to see you to Discord. No shameless promo, only support, only support over yeah. here. I'd love to wholeheartedly and invite back for another discussion because again, we only touched the iceberg here, but it was lovely touching that iceberg. Uh, Jessica, John, Pablo, and Suzanne, thank you so much for being here. Um, I really hope that you enjoyed this conversation. Uh, for all of you in the chat as well, could we get a huge thank you to Jessica, John, Pablo, and Suzanne for joining in for tonight's discussion Thank you. You four are amazing. I'm super blessed um, and lucky to be able to share the virtual stage with you all. For those of you in the audience, stick around just a couple minutes um, and we'll be back with some more information about the upcoming streams. We'll be right with you. Hang tight. All right. Thank you so very much to all of you out there watching from Belgium, watching from abroad, from DIE, from outside of the DIE realm. Thank you so much for watching our Game for Thought season four launch. I can't believe we're at season four already. It seems like I've just blinked and it's gone by. Um, this is by far uh, the most rewarding, uh, enjoyable, fulfilling part of my job. Um, so I'm so thrilled. I'm lucky. I'm blessed to be on here talking to all of you and talking to our wonderful panel members tonight. Thanks once again to John, Jessica, Suzanne, and Pablo who joined us and shared their 
super wonderful insights regarding violence in video games. Um, we couldn't have this without you. We couldn't be here without you. Speaking of not being able to be here without them, our technical crew, I see them in the other room over there. Thank you to Casper, who is our tech stream wizard, our stream king. I now call him. Um, and also thank you to Bradley, uh, who's in there as well, helping out. Thanks to all of our moderators out there that are helping this evening. Patrizia, March, Rico, if I'm forgetting anybody, don't let me live that down. Um, this was the first stream of Game for Thought for the fourth season. As I said earlier, we'll be streaming every third Wednesday of the month for the rest of this year. Uh, I see a lot of hearts in the chat. I send them right back. Uh, so be sure to tune in every third Wednesday of the month. The next live stream, mark your calendars. Another very important topic, um, super relevant for us as human beings and also for people in the industry, mental health in the digital entertainment industry. When will that take place, you ask? I have the answer for you, 22nd of November. So mark your calendars for the 22nd of November. That is the next Game for Thought stream, again, about mental health in the industry. A special thanks, of course, to digital arts and entertainment uh, a big thanks to Hoest, the Flemish Audio Visual Fund, of course, the Flemish Games Association. And speaking of the Flemish Games Association, we also have Game for Thought blog posts. You heard that right. There's a stream and there's blogs now. So if you didn't get the chance to watch the other Game for Thought streams that we had last season, um, if you just we're able to only tune in for a little bit of this one and you really want a nice overview of what the stream was about, check out the website of the Flemish Games Association and you'll be able to read the blog posts about Game for Thought as well that really, um, really superbly highlights uh, the most memorable moments of the stream. With that, thank you so much for watching Game for Thought. I am Allie Weiss, and I am so blessed to be able to be here with you all. Uh, keep these topics in your mind. Keep thinking of the ethically relevant topics in games, in film, in the digital entertainment uh, industry. We will all be confronted with these things. Um, if not now, then some somewhere along the line. Um, and I'm so glad that we're able to bring these to the stage during the Game for Thought stream. I'll see you during the next live stream. Have a wonderful evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you so much for watching. Bye everyone.